Hey everyone, welcome. Let's talk about the Neolithic era. The Neolithic era is pretty simple and there's not a lot that goes into it, but there is a lot to talk about when it comes to setting you up for the rest of the game. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about optimizing your Neolithic gameplay. So one of the very first things you want to do when you enter the Neolithic is get to high ground. This is where I spawned. This is a brand new map. I have no idea what it looks like yet. We've already spawned on a little bit of high ground, so we have decent vision. This is actually a bit of a disadvantage. Um, you'll see that nothing is going to spawn in your vision on turn one. So starting on low ground and moving to high ground can be a little bit more effective. But there is some high ground over here. And you'll see if we move up here, we're gonna get a little bit more vision. This is going to take three movement to get through two we're going over two empty or four movement to get to we're going over two empty tiles right here and then up or if we go to one of to this tile right here that's not a woodland we'll still have one movement remaining after that and it's really important to maximize your movement so flat ground only takes one movement to move over whereas things like woodland takes two movement points and we have four so let's go here, because it will give us one movement remaining after we've moved to that location. And you can see how that makes a difference. So right here we have this food. If I had gone here, I wouldn't have been able to get it this turn. But now I can. And now I have 10 food earlier than I would have otherwise. You'll see this tile was also woodland. Uh, this functions kind of similarly to Civilization V, where if you have one movement left, you can use that movement to get onto any tile. So this is going to apply to rivers as well. So if you want to get on a river, you should use three movement points first before you get onto the river. You want to explore as much as possible. That way you're only using up one movement point to get onto the river rather than three or four, whatever it is. And then once you're on the river, you can actually travel along the river normally once you've moved on to it from the previous turn. So let's end the turn here. You can see there's another high ground position over here that we can uh, look at. We don't have enough to go after mammoths yet. So this is one movement right here and will give us some vision in this direction. You can see there's a deer that we can't get to. Let's get a little more movement. Okay. So we can go down or we can go up to the sanctuary. The sanctuary is a guaranteed population point, whereas this is not. It does look like this is sort of the northern part of the map. You can see the snow right there. So if we're going for the sanctuary, we'll want to move in that direction and then sort of move perhaps down along this way. The sanctuary is a little bit inefficient in terms of movement, however. We don't know what's down this way. I'm going to go for the guaranteed population because I like to play a little bit more safely. But there is a case for going down to grab this food and continuing down in this direction because moving up this way is fairly inefficient if you look at the terrain. When you grab this sanctuary, you kind of have to come down over this way to get out, which is somewhat movement intensive thanks to this forest right here. And even when you do get out, you're going to be in lands that are not ideal to settle, whereas going after this food would spit you out in more land. However, this food is not going to guarantee you that you'll get a population up. So we're going to move up to the sanctuary. So move up to the sanctuary. And if you don't know this already, you can pillage even if you have zero movement remaining. So if you're moving to a sanctuary and you can pick up something else and still end your turn on the sanctuary, you should do that. The only exception is combat. Combat will eat up all of your remaining movement points. So you'll see we have this tribe, and we've got a new uh, new person here. So when you split a tribe, the new one is um, going to... You want to split the new one off because it's more efficient to explore. And when you split your new one off, you can you know click that one and then right-click where you want it to go, they will be reset to zero food, while the original tribe will keep the 10 food. So what we want to do here is we want to get along this river and explore in this direction and open up more territory. Moving onto the river is going to use all of this unit's movement, but leave this my original unit free to explore. 
So we can move on to this river. Even though our movement is exhausted, we can still attack it, this deer, because it is in adjacent territory. If I had moved to this tile and attacked, I wouldn't have any movement after the conclusion of the battle. So I wanted to move on to the river first, because otherwise I'd have to waste another turn. Meanwhile, I'm going to send this tribe back in this direction. There is a curiosity right here. So if I count, I can grab that this turn with my one movement remaining, and then one, two, three, four. So I can make it down to the food still on the next turn. So you want to be very careful in counting what uh, movement is going to cost. I forgot to kill the deer on that turn, uh, which is a um, big mistake on my part because I, I'm slowing myself down. But you got the idea from what I was talking. So we're just going to instant resolve that, but you can do it yourself if you want. So you'll see that eats all the movement. Whereas if I had remembered to do that battle on the last turn, uh, instead I was too busy explaining things, I could have picked up this food on this turn. So uh, these are both viable options. Welcome, where you get this new hunting party, has a chance to give you another event where you lose a hunting party. So be aware when you pick that. I'm still going to pick it. <laughs> Um, not the ideal place to spawn, so we will split these guys up. I'm going to send this one after the Curiosity, because I want this tribe to continue to grow, whereas this one has zero growth so far. So I got five food there, and luckily there's a deer right here, and although we have zero movement, we can attack this turn. I'm going to do a manual battle to try to uh, minimize the amount of damage I take, because who knows if I get into another engagement. And if you don't know already, uh, you get advantage from high ground, you get plus four your, to your combat strength, but enemy uh, units, these animals, do not get high ground advantages. So you can actually attack on onto uphill terrain when you're fighting animals uh, without too much fear. Another thing to note is that normally, when you grow, you can detach your tribesmen, tribesmen like I mentioned before, and they'll still have their full movement remaining. When it is a battle, you cannot do that. So if you have the option between a growing from a deer or growing from a food deposit, the food deposit is ideal because then you get a full turn of movement with another unit that you didn't have before. Whereas killing a deer requires you to wait a turn. So let's end my turn. So at this point, we should really be thinking about where we want to settle. We have another narrative event. So here's disease, lose a hunting party. Um, like I said, that is an option. So if you want to play it safe, you should pick swift instead of the extra hunting party. We're going to pillage that sanctuary. We are going to continue to move along here. And that gives us another tribe. So what we're going to do is split. We could go after the mammoth, but I'm going to have difficulty getting high ground advantage from my current location. I'm not a big fan of going after mammoths. They don't give you like more hunter stars than hunting anything else. So I'm going to split one of these units off, split the original unit. It's going to continue down the river and see there are some uh, either friendly or not so friendly faces right here. Meanwhile, this unit is going to come off the river We'll go up to this position right here so we can get a little bit more exploration done and see if there's anything else worth going after. And then we'll attack the deer. deer. And I'll just instant resolve that. So thinking about where we want to put our outposts. There are some okay locations here um, in terms of just like putting down a straight up outpost, right? Uh, you could go all the way up to this snowy tile, and those outputs aren't great, but keep in, or aren't bad, but the tiles around it are not going to be as good as tiles in most other locations. Well, in the turn here, at this point, it seems unlikely that I'm going to be able to get my knowledge star. It is still possible and sometimes is worth delaying. So, Let's talk about outposts a little bit more thoroughly here. So one option, for instance, would be to go over here on this river. You would have 
an okay number of yields. Um, let's uh, move over and explore a little bit more. Have some mountains here. So if you were to go right here, for instance, right in this area, you would have an okay number of amount of production from the surrounding tiles. You have plenty of space for maker's quarters, but you're hardly going to be getting any food. This doesn't necessarily mean that you should pick the Harappans. You don't want to boost up that food if you don't have places that benefit from the plus one food on yields that the Harappans get, and you don't have anywhere to put agriculture quarters because you'll be losing the yields here. So a good one for this location would actually be the Egyptians, for instance. When you're picking a culture, you want to think about where am I going to put the emblematic quarter and how efficiently can I make use of that emblematic quarter? And for instance, the Egyptians are a culture that has this Egyptian pyramid and it gets extra industry when it's surrounded by maker's quarters. So if I can put it here and then I can put a pyramid here, for instance, or if I found a city here and I put a pyramid here, I can relatively efficiently surround that with maker's quarters and get yields, some uh, tile yields from exploitations without giving up my food yields. Whereas with the Harappans, I wouldn't be able to make effective use of their emblematic quarter, even though it might help grow that city. Another thing to consider as well is where are the borders on these different um, territories? This territory is a little bit small and is a little oddly shaped. If I were to put a, um, a city or an outpost, say right here or right here in this position, you should consider what other territories you want to be taking from the very start of the game. Which other ones do I need in order to build a city effectively? In this case, you probably are going to be looking at this territory right here because it's going to prevent you from expanding given this border. You need to be able to expand out in this direction in order to develop your city more efficiently. Another thing to consider, and I'm going to play a little bit inefficiently from here, uh, just kind of clicking around and seeing what I get. Another thing to consider, however, when looking at outpost locations, um, obviously is how close are you? Oh, a bit of an aside, you can see here that I use my remaining movement to get onto a river with the sanctuary, and without movement I can now pillage for another population. Another thing to consider is how confined are you by the terrain? And when you're thinking about that, the one of the big things that might constrain you other than territory borders is mountains. So if you found an outpost in an area that has a lot of mountains, you are not going to be able to build your districts very efficiently. I'm combining these because there is this hunting party here and I uh, don't want to get attacked. I may be, ap be able to go after them and, and sack their outpost. So, I'm going to uh, not play efficiently here. I'm going to go up in this direction. I suppose I can still get the sanctuary. Ideally, I'd be I'd have planted an outpost down by now. So I'm going to grab that. So imagine you wanted to put an outpost like up in this area up here. You would have a lot of production from these mountains, but you're also going to be very hemmed in by the terrain. It's going to be very difficult to effectively build your districts. So don't blindly follow the suggestion here, right? You need space to grow out. Like if I were to go here or right here, there are only so many areas around it that I actually have the option of building more districts. And if I put it right up here, for instance, which actually has better yields, I'm basically constrained to building on these three tiles as my first option. So Although those expansions can actually be really useful to add to an existing city to make really good use and efficient use of existing tiles, you should also consider how it's going to constrain your gameplay in terms of building out districts. Let's move around here. I do have high ground. Uh, we're both on rivers. I should be able to take this mammoth without uh, losing anyone. I'm just going to instant resolve it. There we go. That gives me some more influence. So where would I put an outpost here? 
Um, I, I do not like uh, Arctic areas. They're... I mean, there are a lot of rivers up here, so this is still a possibility. Like, this wouldn't be terrible. But you have to think about what outposts you want to attach as well. I think, personally, this area looks the best to me in terms of being able to build my city out. If I were to grab this, it would put me very close to this, uh, this territory right here as well. I may want to go for an aggressive culture, and I'll probably also want to attach this territory over here ideally a high production area. So let's go ahead and put an outpost right there. We're going to pick up the food first and then attack the deer. Gives me my hunter arrow star. And you're not always going to get your, um, your science star. It's uh, just not always going to happen. It can be worth delaying if you're relatively close. Get another pop here. Could uh, doesn't matter too much at this point. I'm just trying to get through the motions to talk a little bit more about outposts. And see, this guy is guaranteed to get population up, so let's uh, move him onto that tile there. Got another pop. So over here, if I were to think about what outpost do I want to attach, then I can go for something like right here or right here. Either one of these would work. Um, Let's, we can put it right here, and this would be a perfectly fine city settle as well, even though you're somewhat constrained by these mountains. Now, something to talk about. When you go up an era, at the end of the first turn of the Ancient Era, if you have a developed outpost, you are required to turn that into a city. So say you want this to be your first city, but it's not done developing, but this outpost is. At the end of the turn, you will be required to make that one your city. And I am going to demonstrate that. I'm just going to give the game a quick save. And, whoops. I am screwing up right here. Yes, okay. I'm so used to hitting cancel. We'll just see if I can find any indication that I might be able to get a science star. Might be able to... There is a possibility. Let's detach someone here. We'll go up there. Still need a little bit more. And sometimes things spawn. So I see two right now. I am willing to perhaps uh, give it one more turn before I, before I advance an era just to see if I can get the legacy trait. And that way we can talk about the legacy trait as well. Okay. Someone chose a culture. That's totally fine. There we go. And this one right here should give us the last star that we need. So there's our knowledge star, and now we'll get the option to select a legacy trait. Looks like we're getting the event right here. So, legacy traits. What legacy trait do you want on the times that you can get it? You can get plus one industry per population, plus one food per population, or plus one science per population. It depends, is the real answer. So, consider a situation in which you have founded a city over here. You have plenty of production, right? And you're going to struggle to grow. You might have an outpost over here, but the food tiles are still somewhat limited, and most of it is still fairly mountainous. That is a good candidate for picking food. Alternatively, if you are in an area where there are a lot of plains, say you... You know, say this were more flat and a lot of uh, food production, you may want to consider going for the plus one production per population. There is a case for stacking effects. So for instance, if you have a heavy uh, food production area and you want even more food to grow, you can consider that. It may be a little bit redundant with the Harappans. Science is okay. I find it a little less valuable than the other two personally. But it's a decent option if you have a good balance of yields like we do on our first two outposts here. Really, the, the choice is yours, and you should also consider which of the different um, cultures that you want to take when you go for an era up. Um, because if you're, say, the Egyptians, you will have quite a bit of, of production, and you may be able to stack it up higher, or you may want to supplement one of your weaknesses. 
it's just a matter of uh, what your starting terrain is looking like and how effectively you think you're going to be able to balance all the different stars that you need in the next era. So I was going to say that we could pick the Mycenaeans because we have this very close neighbor. Unfortunately, the AI um, have already picked them. They seem to do that a lot. Picking aggressive cultures when you have a very close neighbor is very viable, and it's already viable anyway. And there's a lot to consider with each culture when you want to era up. Um, and I'm not going to go over every single one of them right now. The Harappans would have been an okay choice here as well. You could put, for instance, a canal district right here and completely surround it with agriculture quarters. The um, Egyptians, however, may not be as good of an option. If you look at the tiles around these two outposts, you can see it would be very difficult to make effective use of maker's quarters. So when you're founding an outpost, consider which of the cultures you actually want to go for, because you want to found your outposts in such a way that you can make effective use of their emblematic quarters. Additionally, you'll see that the territories I settled don't have any resources. Instead, they're over here. Sometimes resources can make or break the game. This incense right here gives you plus five money per incense. There was gold right here that gives you plus 2% money per gold. There's copper right here. You do want to try to claim some of these resources early in the game, and they can also affect which cultures that you might want to pick. If you have early access to gold generation, for instance, it may be more viable to go for a merchant culture. Whereas if you have food, that may make it easier to settle in an area where you have lower food production just from the tiles itself and pick someone like the Egyptians or perhaps someone like the Zhao if you have a, uh, a mountainous kind of area that has a lot of innate production but not as not enough food. So in this case, the Babylonians would be an okay choice. They give plenty of science. They get a adjacency for farmer's quarters. The Egyptians, we've already talked about, not as great given the limited production tiles near me that I could take advantage of. The Hittites um, are kind of in a, a bad spot right now, I would argue, um, but they are militarist and you have a neighbor. The Nubians uh, would not be a good pick, right? The Nubians are someone that are very reliant on a lot of luxury resources, and it's going to take us a while to expand out to those resources. The Zhou, um, not as good either. We're going to be limited on where you can build a Confucian school, though we do have one okay spot right there. And uh, the Harappans, I've already mentioned, would be really good as well the, as the Mycenaeans. The Phoenicians are obviously terrible since we're not near any coastline. The Olmecs, although the Javelin Throwers have taken a big nerf, this Olmec head gets adjacency for Farmer's Quarters, which we have. We can get easy adjacency on our Farmer's Quarters. So consider all those factors when you're picking your culture, when you're founding your outposts. Those are things that you should be considering together. And I'm going to go with the Olmecs here to get that extra influence. And the reason is there's a lot of empty territory over here that I'd like to expand to. I'd especially like to get my hands on copper in order to allow myself to build units that need copper and deny that copper to my enemies. And it'll allow me to get these other uh, luxury resources that'll give me a fairly significant advantage later in the game and even early on in the game. So that influence generation is going to be very important. So I'll pick the Olmex. And looking at my territories here, I'm going to be much more production limited than I am food limited. And particularly as the Olmecs, you're incentivized to get a fair amount of food early with the Olmec heads so that you get that extra adjacency bonus. So I'm going to pick this extra plus one industry per population. And because I'll be growing fairly effectively with all that extra food that I have, um, it'll allow me to also scale up my population. So I'm just going to hold all these guys. Normally you'd go exploring, but I just want to demonstrate this effect right here. Oh, the Let's get past this. So I'm now in the Ancient, and you'll see this city is still growing. And I currently cannot end the turn until I've turned this one into a city. In this case, it's not going to matter too much. Both of these are perfectly viable city locations. So I'm just going to evolve 
evolve this. I have enough population already thanks to my scouts that I can choose my religion. We'll talk about that at a later point. And then on the next turn, because I have a fair amount of influence, I can just attach this outpost. So hopefully this was helpful in thinking about the Neolithic era and how you want to consider what cultures you want to era up to, where you want to put your outposts, and how you're going to play with your hunting parties. Thanks for tuning in. I'll see you next time.